where are you? Thank you. So welcome everybody to our October webinar. Um, we had a fantastic conference um, in September, which we were really, really pleased with the numbers on. And hopefully some of you have managed to make that. Chris did a, a wonderful job doing the emceeing, which was uh, really appreciated. Um, so today we are having a presentation from Stephen Jenkinson, who's going to talk us about um, various dog issues um, in parks. And um, later on, we have um, Mark Humphreys from um, the Lottery, um, National Lottery Heritage Fund over in the east of the region. And he's going to, um, I think we're going to have his presentation as well as some um, question and answers because he wasn't able to make it to, to the conference. So um, that's another opportunity for you to, to hear um some information from the lottery fund which is going to be great so next slide please alison so as i said the dogs in the outdoors presentation from stephen i've just been chatting with stephen and he's um given us some really interesting statistics about how, how the increase in dogs over the pandemic which was a bit phenomenal and a bit jaw-dropping 47 percent increase apparently which is um yeah Pretty amazing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Stephen to do his presentation. Hi, thank you very much, Alison, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, this must rate as the most smiley Teams meeting of the week. You're a very jolly and smiley lot, so that makes me feel at ease. Thank you very much. Unless those are just avatars and you're all uh, really grumpy, but I doubt it very much. <laughs> thank you very much for that introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, a specialist in managing people and the out uh, people and their dogs in the outdoors, which is, is not the most common of jobs. And if we just move on to the next slide, I'll just give you a, a little bit of information of how I ended up being there because my background is in the private sector. So I worked initially in the NHS, so all about things about human health, but I'd always had the passion for both being in the outdoors and wildlife and also doing that with my dog. Uh, so I then retrained and I worked as a rights of way manager. Oh, well, master officer and then a rights way manager in a, a metropolitan authority. And then about 20 years ago, uh, particularly when they were getting uh, open access land introduced, it just struck me that actually, you know, people with dogs are one of our biggest users of green spaces and we're not actually managing them and, and particularly any better than we were in the past. If, if you think there's things that we know a lot more about people with disability or black and ethnic minorities, people like that, you know, and how they will use the countryside and urban green spaces differently. But the dog stuff tended to be just quite negative and not taken forward. So I went and studied the psychology of people and their pets for a few years down at the University of Southampton. And now I bring all those three things together and are the specialist in, in dogs and people in the outdoors. Sometimes called the dog guy, more often called the dog poo guy. And we can do a whole morning on dog poo if you want to. Uh, but what we're going to do today is actually is just in the session, just give you a few ideas of things that are different, things that you may not have thought of before, um, because we could do, I do a whole day event on, on this. Um, but just to give you some ideas, and then you can follow those up, or it might be that you want some, some more sessions. So I work for a range of different people. Uh, I, public authorities, my biggest client is Natural England, but I also work for people like Forestry England, the Kennel Club, uh, Wildlife Trust, uh, and also amazingly to me, EDF Energy. So there's proposals to build a new nuclear power station in Suffolk, and I'm on part of the team working on that, because if they do build it for 10 years, there's going to be um, disruption to where people currently walk their dogs, and there's concerns that that could displace it to sensitive areas for nature conservation and other people and wildlife and livestock. So I, I'm working on that, So, it, so I'm, but I'm not working on the reactor, so you don't need to worry that way. Next slide, please. So yeah, so COVID's been keeping me busy. As Alison said, uh, we've seen a 47% increase in the number of, of dogs, up from about 8.5 mil, uh, million to about 12.5 million. And so even during COVID, it's kept me really busy. So a lot of my work at the moment is on the England coast path, which is probably, unless we get really bad climate change, is not going to be an issue for you folks. But again, that's looking at where dog owners go, what they do, and how can we 
pr promote that, but also uh, minimise impacts on other people and particularly sensitive coastal wildlife. Also, green space design, where new housing developments going on, that sort of thing can make a real difference to where people go and what they do and potentially impacts on the green spaces that you manage. And also online events as well have been really popular for either private dog owners or commercial dog owners. And I front those various bodies to try and bring everybody together. So if we move on then, let's just have a think of some of the demographics about dog walking, because if we actually want to influence the, this group of people, then we actually need to understand kind of what makes them tick. So if we move on to the next slide, dog ownership goes across all socioeconomic groups. As I said, we've got 47% increase in dog ownership, and that means about dogs in 33% more homes, because what happened is some people who had a dog already got uh, another dog, but a significant number actually were people who didn't have a dog before. Children in the home is the best predictor of having a, a dog. So again, that has some issues about how people use green space. And people with dogs tend to see them as a fully fledged a family member. And that we know from the Natural England figures that they're taking on around a half of all visits to, to urban green space and the outdoors. As you'll know, these can be local residents, they can be people who are visiting on holiday uh, or day visitors. So again, that impacts on sometimes how we actually give out information about where we want them to go and what we want them to do. Some of those people can be really active people doing dog sports like can canny cross, which is cross country running with their dogs. But the thing that I always remember as well is that often for some people, and we're increasingly aware of these mental health issues, having a dog may be the only thing that gets them out into green space at all on a day to day basis, or for some people even get up in the morning. So there's a whole range. It's basically people. You know, this isn't a dog management issue at all. This is an issue of managing people and, and just as much as it might be for portable barbecues or, or mountain bikes. Next slide, please. So I've mentioned just a few uh, of the positive things about human, physical and mental health. And there's lots of papers out there now. We know that it just gives people that motivation to walk in all weathers, gives people confidence to be in the outdoors as well. We know that people with dogs as well um, tend to go to the doctor less and make quicker recoveries from operations, all sorts of things. So there's lots of really good stuff and it's important to remember that. I know probably very few of you will be getting emails every day saying how brilliant that is because often people only get in contact when they complain. But this is really important thing to remember because for quite a few of the projects that I'm working with public sector and other partners with, actually, if you just go to your front and say oh this is another project about dog poo or, or about fouling or out of control dogs or whatever it is all very worthy but it's like yeah yeah we've got loads of other projects how do you add value to it the projects that are doing well and, and particularly if we're thinking of some of the lottery funding and, and others that we're going to hear about later is actually if you say well this is a project to support increased people's mental and physical health by the way it will also deal with the, the fouling and the other issues but promoting the good things and minimizing that the bad is much more attractive to funders and your committees and stuff so i'd always remember these things so moving on to the next slide but there's realities there, isn't there? And I'm sure I, I know we often talk about urban spaces, but I'm sure some of you will have things like conservation grazing going on and other stuff. But we know there's still realities in terms of um, dogs and problems. People, dogs chasing sheep, disturbing local wildlife, poo being left on paths uh, and picnics being raided as well. I haven't particularly sought on, on Labradors to point the finger at them being particularly gluttonous. Um, but, you know, it, it's something which to some people might sound funny, but that sort of interaction could put somebody off going to your green space for life. Um, so we shouldn't make light of these things. So moving on then, what do dog walkers so if we have the next slide, thank you. Um, while we can often think, oh, why did they do that? Oh, that was so annoying that actually what dog walkers want is actually fairly simple based on a number of research projects that have been involved with over the years. To feel welcome and safe is a really key thing. Often for any visitors, you know, they want to hear positive messages, negative ones just tend to switch them off. We know that on a daily basis, people are looking for about a one hour dog walk once or twice a day of about two and a half kilometres long, close to home and away from traffic. The vast majority are looking for off lead exercise, not everywhere on that walk, but that's certainly primary motivation to seek that. And I'm sure that's something that causes you some challenges. Just simply saying, well, just keep your dog on the lead all the time is, is a really, really big ask. Uh, and isn't, it's far better to, to approach that in a different way. At weekends, when people have got more time, they'll go to, to different places. Um, but that day to day stuff, say one hour close to home away from traffic. Visitors with dogs will avoid conflict with given an informed choice. So rather than just saying don't do this, it's the do this instead or go to this place instead. 
And looking, and we know again from a lot of the research that dog owners aren't expecting a canine free for all, they just be wanting restrictions to be balanced by accessible alternatives. So next slide, please. So in essence, what I'm suggesting that whatever you're trying to deal with, whether it's poo or dogs off lead or, or whatever it is, or chasing grazing animals, the best management now, particularly from a public um, funding scenario, is to actually be looking at, yes, how do we reduce the negative impacts, but also how do we promote the benefits at the same time? How do we add value to whatever intervention you're going to do? And in essence, remembering that dog, what dog walkers are wanting is happy, healthy, hassle-free dog walks. But in a way, if you take the dog out, that's what people are looking for your green spaces anyway. So moving on then, let's think a little bit about the new normal post-COVID. And a key thing I'd want you to think about as well, which has been ignored in the past, is the issue of displacement. So next slide, please. Because traditionally, and I remember this when I was working in local authorities, we can be really, really good at saying no in lots of different creative ways. Uh, we can see some examples here. Dogs not on a lead will be shot. Uh, I love this one. The land, These lands are poisoned for the protection of animals. You know, we've all been there. If you're thinking you've got problems, though, if you look into the bottom right, here's a, a local authority with a problem with chain smoking, alcoholic dogs on skateboards. So if you think you've got problems, just spare a thought for, for that organisation. But moving on to the next slide then, we could, and often we, you hear this as well, people saying, well, why don't we just use the law? Because, next slide, if by magic, is that just going to make all the dogs disappear like that? Well, it's not really going to happen, but sometimes we talk about that. And this is why um, saying no is ineffective, because we know people will still want to walk their dogs. We still know there'll be that motivation for off-lead access somewhere. And we know for some people, particularly if, if due to economic reasons or health reasons, they can't drive somewhere else, then they're still going to be wanting to use those green spaces on their doorsteps. And um, there's also issues in terms of assistance dog users that we need to, to remember. And also, as you'll pick up later, the key people who are best placed to give information about how to be a responsible dog owner in town, coast or country are actually the dog owners in that canine community themselves. So again, whatever you're looking at doing, I would encourage you to think of actually not just what intervention we're doing, but how do we get those people who are passionate about your green spaces and visiting them with their dog, sometimes visiting them in, in ways and doing things that you, uh, are not wholly appropriate. But how do we get them to be really feel really valued customers and advocates and be ambassadors for good behaviour with, with people like them, if you like, because they're out there all the time. So next slide. So whatever you're thinking of doing, whether it's a, a huge um, country park or whether it's a small town park or whatever it is, we need to manage that demand for dog walking. Because if you're introducing whatever intervention it is, dog walkers can do one of four things, really. They can keep visiting your site if their needs are still met. So that might be, for example, you would have a, a, zoned, a, a zoning approach where some areas were on lead and some areas were off lead. And that was really clearly marked. They might decide to go somewhere else and for some sites it may well be that it's inappropriate for, for dogs to be there at all and, and that situation does exist um but there's also other opportunities they could particularly practically or politically challenge any restriction so you'll all know i'm sure about things in the papers and social media and writing to members and all this sort of thing or also if you've very limited resources for enforcement which is the reality with a lot of um, public bodies actually they just ignore the restrictions anyway because actually they know they're not going to get for a fight or uh, found or caught so planning about where do these people go and what they're going to do if you're wanting to change management is really really important to actually avoid causing problems or potentially displacing people to, to walk dogs off lead somewhere where it causes more of a problem and, and that's a, an issue as well for some people that might be to the adjacent authority and they may think they've got their problem solved but in the whole scheme of things in the spirits of the midlands park forum i'm sure we don't want to be doing that so next slide then so how do we make it easier for people to do the right thing because actually we know people wanting these hassle-free dog walks so next slide and i know myself that often we think we've communicated really well but actually often we don't there are just some examples here where you know you've either got too much all these signs done with really good intention i should say and you know with a passion for, for the areas that they're managing and this is a classic as well in the middle you've got one body here that the peak district national park with a sign up saying that they want to keep their dog on a lead uh, because it's ground nesting bird and nesting time and that sign was left up in november so that also undermines its credibility but then you've got the county council there saying keep dogs under control when you've got those differing messages in the same place, it's really confusing and people will default to the one that best suits their intentions. 
both bodies there trying to do the very best thing. But actually, if we as professionals can't be really clear between different tiers and different sorts of local authority, then how do we communicate uh, with confidence and clarity and credibility to those visitors? So I'd actually, first off, be looking at things actually within your own that messaging within your own departments and your own authorities and making sure that there's clarity there before we try and communicate better with members of the public. Next slide, please. One of the great projects, and this is a client that I've been working with for over 10 years now, is Dorset Dogs. This project is funded by um, mitigation money that comes from housing developers, so particularly when they're developing housing near areas that are designated for special wildlife. And this you can see is that even though this is all about protecting rare ground nesting birds on heathland sites near, near urban areas, front of house, it looks like, wow, I'm a dog. If I'm a dog owner, I want to engage with this. Um, often I'll see things, people have done leaflets um, about either birds or grazing or poo or whatever, and, and they'll not have a, a dog on the front. And, you know, these whole visual images is really important because if we don't get people's attention into the materials that we're wanting to communicate with them with, then we've kind of lost them before we get into the wording or, or whatever it may be. And they also do a great map as well there. So actually, which again is helping people see where are the great places to go where they can exercise their dogs off lead. So it's like, yeah, we don't really want you to go here to exercise off lead, but here are some great places you can go. Next slide. Uh, here's another example. This is down in um, South East England, a Forestry Commission site where actually they're using um, um, a traffic light system to be really clear about where the on and off lead and no dogs areas start and finish. They also had a problem with, with dogs going into some of the ponds where there were um, uh, protected invertebrates, great, chest, great crested newts, things like that. So their approach to that, rather than saying keep out all of, all of the ponds, they developed one of the ponds which was least sensitive to make it really easy for dogs to get in and out without getting muddy. So you can see that the concrete and mortar there. And so people just use that one pond. So again, it's this offering alternatives and trying to manage that demand. Another council, moving on to the next slide, Brighton and Hove, they use conservation grazing in and around very urban areas to both pr promote biodiversity in, on their grassland and also to, to reduce costs in mowing. And because they were having problems there with um, attacks from um, people walking their dogs, um, they actually have this on their GIS system now. People can go on, this is public facing, and see where the sheep are grazing now, uh, where they're going to be soon, because that pre-departure decision for people, if it's not green space on their doorstep, you know whether I'm going to go here or going to go here today, actually is really important because once people you'll know have arrived on your site, even if that doesn't actually quite meet what they want in terms of what you're wanting as a green space manager, they're probably likely going to do it anyway. So one thing to think about and, and to look across your, your authority is actually what pre-visit information is out there. They also have a Twitter feed and so they amazingly have this sheep uh, which actually puts Twitter feeds out. So if the dog owners in that area can um, follow that and so they can see when the sheep are being moved uh, and where to. Another next slide, please. Another thing which I know for some of your sites is still relevant where you've got grazing going on is actually giving people choices. So this is a, a project um, again that I've been involved with where actually to, to reduce the we get about three or four people killed every year in the UK by being trampled by cattle, even though the right of way goes straight across the middle of this field. Um, in this case, uh, this is a pilot project offering people an alternative on a permissive route round the outside, or in, around the, around the outside with um, electric fencing or in another field. Actually, people are happy to do that. They don't necessarily want to follow the right of way. They just want to have this happy, healthy, safe dog walk. So again, this is something that's giving them an alternative and also it helps the farmer feel less um, worried too. So we've got all these interventions. Next slide, please. Trying to deal with stuff and um, and that's already there and that's really important but also oh okay i do have another slide there i don't know what's happened there alison but there's a, a slide there that says planning out problems from the start i'll keep on talking and hopefully they'll pop up so one of the key things which hasn't been done particularly well uh so yeah so some of my slides have been cut off there alison you might want to go back to my um original file so one of the key things that's um happening is that we know in a lot of your areas you'll be having quite large developments in or around your green spaces and we know for example now that between a quarter and a third of all homes people are going to have a dog with them just as much as we might think is where is their surface water going to go to where's their sewage where's their children going to go to school that sort of thing we know that they're going to be wanting to walk their dogs every day 
So what's happening now, the best authorities are integrating this with their planning teams and their green space managers to particularly where you've got um, um, special protection areas for birds and special areas of conservation and for habitats to be able to um, get funding from developers so that actually whether it's additional green space or better infrastructure or whatever it is, is provided at the developer's expense. So for example, um, down on the Thames Basin Heaths, a levy of around £7,000 per home is being, is, has been in place for some time now to actually manage green space better and also to provide that revenue funding, because I'm sure a lot of you will know that you might get funding from, say, a 106 agreement um, to put in some infrastructure, but actually uh, it's the maintenance of that which can be a real uh, challenge as well. So, um, and there's a, a guidance that um, I can share with you. So what's happened in some places there in and around Reading, we've had uh, uh, in one case, a number of developers bought up a 46 acre farm and turned that into a really good bit of public green space with trees and, and, and making sure that that was uh, off lead as well. So actually it gives people a choice to avoid the sensitive areas at ground listing bird time, but actually to go to this new green space. But the principle applies whether it's protected species or whether there's lots of pressures on your park. The opportunity to get um, information out, um, sorry, to get funding out of developers is really, really important and worth speaking to your planning teams about because we know that, you know, say a quarter to a third of all new homes, they're going to be wanting to use green space on their doorstep. Can I just check where we are with the slides, Alison, because I can carry on verbally or are we potentially going to have them pop up? I'm just going to Dropbox to see if I can find the missing slides. So give me another couple of seconds. OK, that's fine. I'll carry on because I'm aware of time. Otherwise, I could open mine up and uh, insert them from here. So do let me know. The other thing, even if there isn't new green space on your doorstep, a way to actually encourage dog owners to exercise their dogs, particularly off lead into places where you'd prefer, is to just improve things like fencing alongside roads because actually if, if it's open or there's a fear that for some reason it isn't safe, pe people will avoid off lead in those areas. And that might be good, but it may not be helpful. So again, in some cases, developer contributions have provided one 1.2 metre fencing uh, along the edge of busier roads. So you get more use of existing green space. Equally, the changing of things like styles to gates or improving surfaces, again, to encourage to get walkers with dogs to go to places that are better suited to their needs because actually they want to, not because they've told they can't go somewhere else, but actually we like this place better because there's some uh, bins or there's some better um, path surfacing or whatever it is, or it feels safer and we feel there's a good community there. So that planning up front about where people are going to go and what they're going to do when they move into these new houses is really, really important. One of the, when we're talking about green spaces, I know um, Alison had brought up uh, the issue of um, dog walking fields. Do you, I'm just wondering what to, oh look, there's something going on here. Yeah. Um, okay. So if we've got the one that starts dog, enclosed dog areas, that's where we're at at the, at the moment. Oh, I'll carry on um, because they'll share these slides uh, with you. So yeah, crack on a bit. Go down some more, some more. That's it again. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah, that that one. Brilliant. Okay. Well recovered team. Thank you. So um, yeah, so in terms of uh, good design as well, and these are things that can again bring in income, uh, even if it's not near a new housing development. So these dog washes, um, these are funded by a commercial company, but are being introduced into popular areas for dog walking. They also offer, offer an opportunity for placement of really good information for dog owners, because if dog owners are going there, what a better place to remind people about picking up or doggy events or whatever. And we also know, you know, these things can be good for business in terms of, of cafes and other things. So these are all things that were provided to actually um, get people with dogs to visit some places more than others. Even things like drinking bowls as well uh, can be really helpful. And again, this is most of this is secured through developer contributions or just working with, with the private sector. Moving on to the next slide, the enclosed dog areas. Um, when these are run by uh, commercial firms, uh, individual farmers, uh, I know a number of farmers who found they've turned the least productive field into the most productive field in terms of money by doing this. And there's probably about 450 sites uh, around the UK now. Uh, you need a size of about uh, one acre 
There's this one in, in your area just off the M6 called Pounders Park. And you can just see from that picture there, there's differential mowing going on. And people can hire exclusive use for themselves or a few of their friends from between six or 20 pounds per hour. And it can work really, really well uh, and be quite productive. But for the public sector, it's not quite as simple as because unless you're going to manage that, imagine that you'd got a private swimming pool and then you said that people booked and paid for. But then you said, actually, we're just going to have this swimming pool and anybody can come at any time. And, and that's the challenge because um, enclosed areas can be really good. They can be a great way of providing on site dog training and working with local dog trainers to get better control. And you get the dog trainers to give the, the other messages that you want as well. Um, but actually, if it's not going to be unmanaged, there are things that you really need to think about in terms of safety inspections. They can also be potentially if there's broken glass there and things like that, a bit like children's play equipment uh, for a start. But also, if you've got a really good one, what can happen is that you'll actually attract a lot of more dogs to your green space. You might want that. Um, but in other cases, you might be attracting more of the unruly dogs. So, you know, it can be quite a mixed blessing. The key thing is how it's managed, to be honest. There's also things about surfacing, but there's also things about actually what do we want people to do with their dogs? Because this middle picture is, um, and I've worked all over the world doing this and, and researching. This is um, a dog park on the outskirts of Chicago, and you can see what happens here, that it's a nice fenced in area, so you don't need to kind of look after your dog. But what happens is that people sit and read or just stare into sprays, and they don't take any exercise or interact with their dogs. Um, which kind of undermines this more holistic approach that we, we were looking for. The picture below as well, um, again, really well intentioned by this local authority that put it in. But basically, you've got in the foreground with the green fencing, that's an area, quite a small area that was put inside, put in place for off, off lead dogs, particularly because there were public spaces protection air orders elsewhere in the area for dogs being off on, being kept on lead. But right next to a, a children's play area and there is no boundary fencing between the two. So, for example, uh, children in that area could go over to the edge of the, the dog bit. They'd be attracted by dogs quite easily, put their hands through or arm through into the dog area. Most dogs are absolutely OK, but you can see where that could go. And actually, uh, in terms of good design and appropriate safety and risk assessment, you know, these things can work well, but they need to be thought about really, really carefully. And it might be that you want a, another session with that or for me to, to give some more input to your authority. So I would just tread very carefully. The other thing is that if you've got small areas, it's not probably going to reduce the demand for off lead exercise, but probably it will help people maybe train to have better behaved dogs off lead. Whereas if you've got something like a, a 46 acre woodland, then that can make a really big difference. Next slide, please. So to try and wrap things up a little bit more, uh, because this is a bit of a whirlwind tour, I want to introduce the concept, um, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, of One Health, because partnership working is really important in this field. If we go on to the next slide, just to explain this concept of One Health, and you can go and search for this online after the event, this is saying that actually we're all interconnected, so that human health is dependent on, let's just let Hillary in there, human health is dependent on the health of the environment and the environment is dependent on the health of both companion animals and livestock and wildlife, that it all needs to go together. So there's quite a lot of work going on now with vets and public health officials and wildlife people all trying to work together to do this in an integrated way. Next slide, please. And in terms of dogs, I'd encourage you to think of this because we know from research that's going on, if we can have the next slide, um, that actually dog owners are most influenced by other dog owners and canine professionals. It's not by park rangers or what the local authority says or what the law says. So, and if we just press again, Alison. So the key thing to have you to remember is that actually whatever you're doing, see how you can get the canine community at the heart of whatever you're doing, because they can be really great ambassadors for what you're wanting to do. And just some examples of how that's worked well. Um, so again, down in Brighton and Hove with these sheep that they were using to um, graze the, the green spaces in and around the city. What they did, rather than seeing dog walkers as a problem, they recruited them to be what they call lookerers or volunteer shepherds. So that when they're out on their daily dog walks, um, they're keeping an eye out, first of all, where the sheep are, so then they keep their dogs on leads, but looking for sheep that might be stuck on their back or that a water trough is empty or something like that. And actually just being really good ambassadors. Uh, you don't have to have a dog to do that scheme, but they've actually found that the dog owners have, have, have been providing the biggest take up. So again, what might have seemed to have been, oh, it's a dog walker problem. 
actually dog walkers can often be the part of the solution as well. Um, moving on to the next one, commercial dog walkers as well. Again, we could do a whole big session on this, but for some workshops I did for Scottish Natural Heritage, but in the central belt of, of Scotland, so a relatively built up area. We know that from the workshops that we did with the dog walkers, um, that they're really keen to be again to be seen as good responsible people to trust with your dog and so knowing where you can go what you can do where it's safe where to avoid livestock all this thing sort of thing was actually seen as adding value to their businesses so actually they were really keen they're also keen to put the the, uh, the bad operators out of business and there's various ways that public authorities have engaged with that by having voluntary uh, accreditation schemes um, and the good folk are wanting to get involved with that the other thing is raising awareness for their clients that actually not all good, all commercial dog walkers are actually looking after your dog properly. There's been some horrific incidents where dogs have, have died of heat stroke from being left in vans and all this sort of thing. So again, a role of engaging with dog walkers in a way that seems quite positive, but is also helping responsible dog ownership and walking. Moving on to the next slide then, just on my way out. You've probably been scribbling um, all sorts down to, to see what you could do in the in the future and hopefully I've raised your eyes to some of the opportunities there. A key thing is actually how do we manage that demand and, and the picture on the right is just showing you another example that I love. This is down in Hampshire where there were concerns that the dogs were going in and out of the river bank causing erosion and that meant it meant that it was really difficult for the, the fish to spawn because the, the rivers just got clogged up um, where they used to put their eggs in and where the pebble where the pebble beds were. Instead of just putting up signs saying no dogs in the water or just fencing it all off, what they did was provide a really good area for dogs to get in and out of the water. You can see here using railway sleepers and just saying, look, if your dog wants to go into the water, this is a great place to do it. And dog walkers love doing this because actually it means that dogs don't get muddy going in and out of the side. So actually, yes, you've got an area there where there are dogs going in and out, but the rest of it has been protected just by that positive engagement. So it might be that some of you are thinking, um, wow, um, let's uh, let's get Steve to do all this. Well, I have to tell you um, that it's great that I'm really, really busy and actually I don't want to do it all for you. Well, how I like to work with people is give you that wider experience and national, international best practice to apply because these things need to be really, really relevant to the communities and areas that you serve. No one place is, is the same. But key things, making it easier to do the right thing, promoting the good while reducing the bad, um, trying to manage that demand rather than um, suppress it and planning for dogs in new housing and collaborating across sectors. So I hope that's just moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so we've covered both of that really. So yeah, helping you um, work on local projects to apply best practice. Site audits and policy review is a lot of what I do, training and workshops or front of house stuff. But, you know, hopefully that's given you some ideas as to what can go forward. And um, it was nice to see Neen Park here as well, because I've worked with them in the past. But also think about working with planners as well and all those sorts of things. Right. I'm aware of the time and given everything with the slides and stuff, I'm really pleased to see where we are with that. I'm happy to take questions, but for now, I'll pass you back to Liz. And thank you very much for your attention. That's lovely. Thanks very much, Stephen. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Um, Stuart, do you want to kick off? Yeah, um, I was, uh, you know, we've had quite a, a few requests that, we, that come in from time to time for these designated areas where you can train your dog. Um, by kind of accident almost, we, we there were some disused tennis courts where it started to happen um, several years ago. And it caused an awful lot of problems. I think people were putting it on Facebook and there were people coming yeah. from miles around with um, various dogs. And obviously, by the nature of you needing an area to um, contain them in, they usually have some behavioural problem or other. They're probably very, they might be very boisterous and friendly or they might be, you know, not like other dogs and be a bit aggressive and so need to have their own space. So it's something we've tended to avoid since, really, because um, the idea of, of having a lot of problem dogs in one place, uh, you Absolutely. know, we have we have a general rule other than in certain areas around lakes, sports grounds, et cetera, that dogs should be under reasonable control. So, you know, and there's plenty of parkland to um, exercise them on. So, as I say, it's something we've tended to avoid. I mean, I've had dogs all my life and I did have one who was 
had no brakes and steering for till he was about eight years old. So I know what it's like to have one like that, but I, I, I do think it's, as I say, we've, we've tended to steer clear of having specific areas. I don't know what your thoughts are on these, these specific, you know, enclosures where people can um, sort of uh, let a dog like the one I had the, off the lead and, and, and know that he's not going to run off because he's in a contained area, but they're usually fairly small areas and you want to be able to really adequately exercise him anyway, you know, yeah. uh, you know, so. Absolutely, Stuart. I think you're really being quite <laughs> wise there um, because, um, so for example, again, down in Hampshire, they had one of these areas and people were driving from London. I mean, in, in some ways it's really great because actually these people are wanting to do the right thing. They're wanting to not cause hassle with their dogs, but it's how we manage that. And so the approach I would say now is, is kind of akin to what the private sector are doing with these dog exercise fields, which is actually manage that. Um, and actually what's seeming to work well is where people um, engage with like a local reputable trainer. So maybe one that's a uh, kennel club accredited instructor, but there's other people as well out there. Uh, and actually then you, they use it to, to run on site dog training where that fencing, you know, helps, but it's in a managed way. And so in some cases, some authorities are charging the dog trainer to use that. But in other cases, they're just doing it for free as long as the dog trainer, you know, gives out the right messages about where to go and what to do and picking up and that sort of thing. But yeah, it, it sounds great. People see it in North America and Australia and places like that, where they tend to be the only places where dogs can be let off lead. But that that's totally different. And they do have problems. You see dogs being killed in those areas. Um, and also just you get concentration of feces and urine and stuff. So it's not it's not an easy answer, but for actually providing on site training for those people who need a bit more help, because it's it's much easier than, you know, working with distractions and trying to do it in a, in a community hall where there aren't other people and rabbits or balls and stuff can be great. So it's great to hear your experience there, Stuart, because that's what I, I would I would say myself. Thanks. Great. Um, Alison, you're next. Um, yeah, it wasn't wasn't so much a question, but actually sort of linked into what the previous person was just talking about. Um, Solihull Council do have a um, sort of enclosed dog walking area in one of our parks. Um, I've only been with the council about six months and I literally, I think like maybe the first week of working there, we're like, oh, don't, don't get involved with that area. <laughs> Um, and it's almost like it's been provided, but I think it's really, it's more of a reflection from what Stephen was saying. That I think it's, um, how is that space actually managed? It's great that it's there, but it's almost been, I think, kind of put in and gone, right, we've done it, ticked a box. But actually, um, <laughs> that's not meant to sound negative at all, but it's more to say that I think there's an opportunity there, perhaps, for me to, um, yeah, look at things like signage, look at how we promote the benefits of it. And actually, it's a really big selling point for the park. And as you say, it can bring people in, get them using the, the park generally, but gives people with who are dog who have dogs like a really safe space to to be welcomed into. But I think it's it's just kind of it'd be interesting, maybe Stephen offline, if I could maybe get some advice again specifically about that um with you. I might get in touch with you, but just to look at it I think it's it's not something that I think we want to go we've ticked a box and that's it I think we can really sell it and just go a bit further with it and I've got um some college students that are interested in doing projects so I'm just trying to sort of think about how maybe I can get those those guys involved with sort of selling that specific area and picking it up as a bit of a project with me um but yeah so it's more just reflection really um and, and hopefully I can get in touch with you Stephen directly if that's okay Absolutely. And I would do so because if it's something that's been provided and, and if something bad happened and people are passionate if, if their dogs get injured, then the questions do come back. Well, what was your risk assessment? How did you think this? How did you inspect it? They can be really good, but they need to be seen as an integrated part of the whole green space. Yeah. Um, and also, ideally, we'd be wanting to help people train their dogs better or to use things like long lines and harnesses and that sort of thing so that it doesn't end up being like a, a bad dog ghetto or something like that. Yeah, that is exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> we, we feel um, integrated. The other thing as well is being mindful that what can happen sometimes is that visitors without dogs to the green spaces can think that's the only place for dogs to be off lead. And if there isn't clarity, then they see a, a perfectly well behaved dog, but off lead somewhere else. And then that causes needless friction. So I would just step back and look at it in a, like a, an integrated way, how it's used. I wouldn't say never do it or always do it, but it's you're absolutely right, uh, Alison. It's how it's done and how it's provided, but also then managed as well. Thank you. This has been useful for me to think about. So thank you. 
Great. So have we got anybody else with any questions? Stuart, is yours a, an old hand? <laughs> Sorry, it's an old hand. I've not taken it down. Sorry about that. OK. Um, the guys from Birmingham, I know Birmingham City Council did some some work around dog control orders um, <laughs> recently. Um, would you like to tell us about your experience, Joe or Phil? Have you been able to do any enforcement? <laughs> Well, the enforcement doesn't come down to us. It would come down to our, our colleagues in uh, environmental services. So I think the uh, the PSPOs were rewritten. Uh, they've got less less powers now than than they had first time around. Uh, again, we couldn't enforce dogs on a lead through that. It had to be dogs under reasonable control which is what the law says anyway so uh to be honest since they were rewritten last year I, i've not heard anything more about them so uh the the problems we have uh regarding dogs uh are more about the damage that dogs do to infrastructure so the uh the use of playgrounds as training venues for uh, potential dog fighting uh, and strengthening their jaws the amount of damage that's caused there is is amazing and obviously then those sites look shocking, so they deter legitimate use. Have you got any any really interesting um, solutions for that, Stephen? The yeah, dog play I, think area. <laughs> I mean, it, it all depends on the circumstances, but again, it's a really important thing to, to bring up. If, if your colleagues haven't looked at it, I would certainly, people tend to pick up on the public spaces protection orders. Um, but also uh, allied to that in the same legislation, these community protection notices. And in some cases, those can be a better tool where you've just got certain individuals that are causing problems rather than your whole dog owning community as a whole. Because there, for example, those have been used by, well, against commercial dog walkers who've had too many uh, dogs uh, and not in control, but also people causing not just problems with dogs, but anything really. And so those can be a much more targeted way if, if you know what it is. Um, I'm actually. Uh, I mean, I do quite a lot on PSPOs as well for, for different clients, but also I'm um, running a course for Keep Britain Tidy on the 9th of December. You can find it on their website. And that's in terms of going into a bit more detail about how we get the behaviours we want without enforcement. But th the key thing is that actually, as I said at the start, I guess, this isn't a dog problem, it's a people pro person, you know, and the people who are engaging in these things, just like in rural areas, we things, see things like hair coursing and stuff. The dog is just a symptom, really. It's just a, a tool, just as much as drunk driving, you know, it's actually still a person, it's not the car. Um, but certainly I've been looking at um, community protection notices and there's a, ver a range of different options that go with that. Uh, DEFRA put out some really good guidance uh, online that covers all the antisocial behaviour provisions, which can be used for all sorts of things, you know, um, not just dogs. But I would have a look at that. But certainly PSPOs sometimes can be used, uh, I would say, inappropriately, where there's just a problem with a small number of people and you do a PSPO that applies to everybody and you wind up all the good people and then problem people just ignore it. So I think there's a decision there about actually is it everybody or do you want to use more targeted measure methods and in those circumstances you might want to look at more targeted methods often as well you find that there are other uh problems that these people are not only you know that there's other issues of concern to the police and social services and things like that it's and the, and the dog fighting stuff is, is just a, a horrific but just another uh, symptom of of people with those sort of attitudes towards animal welfare and green spaces Great, thank you. What about the, the people from um, Warwickshire County Council? You talked a little bit about some of your problems on the country park. Hello, sorry. Were you on uh, mute? <laughs> uh, yes, I was. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, we were... We, we were just beginning to try and tackle this issue, really. So we were looking at the red, green, amber, um, marking out, zoning the park, thinking about that. Because until now, we've just had, you know, dogs, are, dogs not allowed in play areas and dogs on leads around cafes and courtyards. Um, but we were basically just looking for some ideas as how best to tackle it. Um, because we haven't really got anywhere that can be a designated 
enclosed dog uh, off leads area um and there's a, there there are a lot of people that have their dogs on a lead because they're unfriendly you know they're not mm -hmm. they they are unfriendly dogs uh but then dogs that are off leads come running up to the unfriendly dogs and then it causes problems so it's it was trying to engage with them all and and get some kind of happy medium for everybody really yeah and, and that is an issue and, and you make a really good point that actually some on lead areas shouldn't be seen as necessarily a bad thing because people if they've got dogs that have behavior issues or recovering from operations or maybe partially sighted or something like that you know that can be a real help and um, one of the key things as well is, is communicating stuff clearly because you're absolutely right that we'll think about leads and poo but actually messaging about you know they will say oh it's only a friendly dog it doesn't matter but you know that person could be either be petrified or become petrified because of that and, and it's just totally not acceptable and actually some of the wording if you look at um the dog walking code that was again something i worked on with natural england which you can find at dogwalkingcode.org.uk it is on the gov.uk website but it's hard to find so i have that um, address to find it there there's messaging which tries to say in behavioral terms what we want people to do so again the message is about just always having your dog in sight don't let it approach other people unless you're sure they're okay about it are things that we tend not to say we, you know, sometimes we have a fixation with saying close control or control, but actually even your dog under control is, isn't that great because uh, your dog can be, if the person allows it to run, you know, the dog might have a great recall, so it's not out of control. You're just allowing it to run up to somebody because you don't think that's a problem. So I would also think about clarity before you change anything. It's actually, are you being clear about what you want now? And, and as we've heard, just having um, smaller off lead areas tends not to work. But if you, um, I mean, it's hard to say without knowing, it's not just your site as well, it's actually what's happening on adjacent sites because sometimes we see in you know, displacement to and from green spaces. But it's looking at the whole lot and I will be trying to be really clear about, you know, what are you communicating at the moment? And often if you can find a good, what some people do is run what they call a dog pit stop where they just put up a gazebo or something and get some free dog biscuits and, and stuff like that. If you look at the Dorset Dogs website, you can find that. <laughs> And people just drop in and and dog walkers will often be, love to talk to you about their dogs and, and say, you know, what do you like about this park? What are the problems? And they will give you that data. You don't need to take on fancy consultants to find that. They will usually tell you. Um, but I would just look at a whole range of things, of what can be done. Um, but zoning can work, but it needs it needs to fit. If it's a bad zoning system, then it won't work. Um, and you also want to avoid winding all the decent people up because that can end up with more problems and actually trying to get a grip on what specific behaviours you want, where and when and how you can play about with that. And incremental steps as well can, can be a really good thing. I'm sorry I can't be more specific, but hopefully that's given you some stuff to think about. Um, yeah, I'll let I'll nice. pass on to Liz the, the green space guidance that I wrote. Oh, mind you, there's a link to it, which is um, dogfriendlyhousing.org.uk. Uh, which was on the slides and you can download the document there and that gives you some good ideas about green space design and management as well great and then maybe you can come back and um, talk to us in, in the future about how successful you've been at uh, your country parks in Warwickshire let you know how we get on <laughs> yeah if, if there is a need for something you know um pre-covid I used to do a one day course where there was theory in the morning and then in the afternoon people would work work up their own plans and, and work together to say okay what do we want where do we want it how do we communicate it and that sort of thing and those things are moving on to to online now or I work directly with particular authorities but I don't need to say there's so much demand which is really great uh, but I would also think about how do you integrate that with terms of promoting the health benefits as well, because that makes for a much nicer narrative rather than just what you'll get, which is a knee, knee jerk. Oh, you're picking on all the dog walkers. Actually, a more balanced narrative just in PR terms can be really, really helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree. That was definitely the way we need to go is to have a more positive um view on things and, and not just say no dogs here and no dogs there because that's you know the the, the easiest option sometimes but it's not going to get us the results uh, that we want absolutely so. you need to be aware though that when you start approaching them in a positive way it does freak them out sometimes you know it's like this thing <laughs> where sometimes the police pull people over for for just saying thank you you were sticking to the speed limit because 
Uh, that's what we found with some of the research that actually sometimes they said, actually, this is the first time anybody's asked about me and my dog. You know, you ask lots of other groups and stuff, but actually our expectations are just that we might get a poo bin and not told off. Uh, yeah. And actually, these people are passionate about our green spaces. And, it, and if in times of funding cuts, we want these people who are who, yes, uh, can cause problems when they come in large numbers, but probably half of all your visitors, if they want to say, yes, yeah, so and so the range is great or this and that to your members when they're looking at cuts, then that to me is almost the bigger issue. So that relationship with them uh, is really important rather than just a particular intervention or, you know, one or two people not doing the right thing. Lovely. Is there anyone else that um, wants to ask Stephen a question or has got some interesting um, ideas about um, dog issues on their particular park? What about Neen Park? What are your um, experiences? Yeah, all your great stuff that's going on there. <laughs> Come on. Hello. Yeah, no, really interesting. I, uh, a few questions, but I'm, I'm sort of mulling them over in my mind. I, I guess um, this this issue of um, conflict and non-dog owners um, sort of complaining about dogs coming up to them, and we get quite a lot of that. And we're thinking about do we zone the park? No, I don't think so. What I've heard from you is I think it's it's um, well, people have to sort of co cohabit the same space, don't they? And it's it's about getting the message out there about using leads and not using leads and sort of making sure people understand what the rules are maybe and um yeah and I, yeah so yeah lots to learn really and lots to understand i had a question i was thinking about our rangers and how involved should they get in trying to sort of um keep the peace or should we just sort of you know is, is that a not not a, not a path to go down oh what rangers going out with their own dogs no no i mean as in rangers are there, are there is sort of people uh, conflicts out there with dogs and trying to tell people to put them on leads or or, or whatever sort of trying to sort of police the area um, themselves is that a, something we, we ought to sort of avoid? Um, well it, again it depends how it's done so in Thames Chase Forest so just on the edge of the M25 uh, to the east of London they're the forest well Forestry England now I have to use the right terminology uh, had a really good project there where they actually um, they had dog training done and then the people who had done all the dog training were so passionate about well my dog can have more fun and, and I don't actually feel as worried about it because I have a good recall and know when to use the lead then wanted to become ambassadors and they had a real job yeah. thinking up. so it is how it's done the key thing is actually people you know it sounds facile to say but people take more notice of people like us you know and sometimes we yeah. as professionals know far too much about the sites and stuff um, but I know you've worked with a, a local dog trainer there with um, um, in terms of the activity trail and stuff. But I would also, it's, yeah. it's probably 10 years since I've been to your site, but thinking about, you know, is that message about just not letting your dog, you know, well, we try to use positive, so we'll say prevent, preventing your yeah. dog running up to other people uninvited. Actually, how clear is that? Because I know people laugh and say, oh, and the dog walker said, oh, he's only friendly. But to that owner, it is. You know, they just don't yeah. always appreciate just you know as much as my collection of ABBA CDs is wonderful to me some people might find that totally abhorrent you know and it's they're not intentionally bad people but they don't realize that for anybody but also people from different cultural uh, um, backgrounds um, a dog running up to them can be a really really bad thing that you know can put them off green space just as much as somebody else I mean conflict between different dog owners is as much you know dog on dog attacks which is a really yeah. challenging issue so it's it's managing that space but yeah i would i would have a look at the moment adrian and just see actually what information is there about that because unless it's being exactly. communicated clearly on arrival then how can we expect people to, to know that isn't okay yeah absolutely that's the that's the message i'm getting yeah thank you lovely thank you very much lovely otters as well adrian <laughs> so um do we want a little a little break now, a little uh, five minute break before we start again? Would people appreciate that? Should we come back at um, five past two? So you can get a cup of tea, go to the loo. Yeah, great. Great, thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, thanks Stephen. Are you going to stay on, Stephen, for our next bit or are you leaving? 
I've so it, uh, I've I'm just looking at I have actually some reports. I'm going on leave next week, so I have some reports I need to finish off. But yeah, do put the slides out and then just see where folk want to go with it um, and, and take it from there. But hope but that was a nice response and it's given people something to think about, which I think is, is the best we could do.